So, ladies and gentlemen, very welcome for the second part of our Eurovisions conference. And as announced, we will have the Science Slam competition today. Of course, we are talking about Eurovision. A Eurovision conference without a competition would not be a Eurovision conference. And, of course, a Eurovision conference without the Eurovision anthem would not be a Eurovision conference. So I ask you all to sing together with me the Eurovision anthem. La 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 Okay, so a competition needs rules, and the rules are as follows. We have three competitors today, and they will each have the 15 minutes for presenting their new contributions to Eurovision research. I will look 15 minutes, not more. If I do this, you have to stop. And um, in the end, you can vote, everyone here in the, in the room. And you online, you can also vote. Just write your votes in the commentary section and we will consider them. You can also write your questions to the speakers in the commentary section and we will try to ask them. So uh, we will, when we have the um, recap of the three contributions, so that is the discussion section and all the presenters can be asked questions, so then we will try to include your questions. So uh, don't hesitate if there's something that you don't understand or if there's something that you want to get more information, so then ask your questions online. So we have uh, three uh, candidates today from three different countries, from France, from Turkey, and from Germany. So very welcome to our First presenter, Etienne Rio from France, and uh, please, uh, the stage is yours. Yes. So, uh, good morning everyone. I am Etienne Rio and I am a PhD in Urban Planning and Studies from France. Uh, so, I will talk to you about uh, a proposition of research because it's not a research that I've done. I am just starting to do it. Um, it's about the city strategies for hosting your vision song contest. As I'm a researcher in urban planning and design, I'm focusing always on cities. Uh, I think it's also um, a good uh, starting point because we are always talking about uh, politics and state. That's one of my passions. I graduated first in politics. And uh, then we are also focusing on uh, the show, the entertainment, the cultural issues regarding each edition of Eurovision Song Contest. But then there is something between them, which is um, the scale of the city. Uh, we could just start from these three different scales, the ESC through EBU, EBU as an international technical organization, then states um, that are uh, hosted through the broadcasters, public broadcasters, but then also host city. The host city uh, is not something that has been that much research in uh, researches. I just try to, to find some first literatures about that. And it's always case studies focusing on one city or um, the case studies focusing on uh, cultural issues regarding one edition or different edition of ESC. But there is much real comparison between host cities and the way cities are welcoming your vision to contest and the consequences of it. Um, we could have uh, two perspectives to compare. 
Um, it's to understand what is the impact of ESC on urban space and urban development. Um, the, 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 the majority of the cases we could have could be uh, that ESC is gaining from a cost city, gaining from the infrastructures that already exist, and that it is just a regular event. But then we should define that regular event as an international or as a more standard event because regarding the number of people coming, it can be seen as something very big, but sometimes it is just regular, for instance, in Dusseldorf uh, um, or uh, in Paris, as other events that are organized in those cities. Then there is a second case, which is when the host city benefits from ESC. And I'm going to speak about three cities uh, that, in a, in a certain point of view, are gaining from the organization of host city, of ESC. I've chosen three case studies, Baku, Malmö, and Tel Aviv. Uh, Baku in 2012, Malmö in 2013, and Tel Aviv this year in this fabulous white city. Um, we see that for each one of uh, the cities, we could have such developments. Uh, in Baku, it is clearly a state-driven uh, organization. Uh, the, uh, Baku is capital of Azerbaijan. It is not a capital of economic elite, but of state elite and administrative elite. And everything has been done to organize in budget, or not in budget, but in time, the contest. Uh, and we see that the host city benefited a lot from ESC. ESC was not uh, an only one event for uh, the international recognition strategy of Azerbaijan. It was a starting point of different events, the European Games in 2015, and this year, the League in uh, um, and we see that um, also the policies of the state have been completely diverted and focused on the host city development. Um, part of the welfare uh, policy has been cut and the funded have been provided to finish the construction of uh, the Crystal Hall, the famous stadium that has been built for the Eurovision Song Contest. Part of uh, water programs have been also cut in order to fund transportation uh, and improvement in the capital of Baku. So we are, we are here one of the perhaps most uh, sophisticated case of an entire state taking his fund and cutting some of his public policies to strengthen and achieve some of the urban development needed to host the contest. Is it a good or a bad thing? I think we should discuss about it because Eventually, Baku gained a lot of uh, recognition and of better understanding by tourists and attracted more tourists this year than the year previously. But as I mentioned, it, part of the population uh, saw his uh, public program for water or social welfare to be cut uh, this year because they wanted to achieve the uh, good conditions of uh, welcoming fans and singers uh, in Baku. In Malmö, um, it's a more traditional European case study. Uh, there have been some uh, tenders between some bidding processes between Swedish cities to welcome uh, ESC. Uh, Malmö won in 2012, and it was a clear strategy of uh, achieving what was the post-industrial transformation of Malmö. And we see it clearly in the way uh, ESC has been introduced uh, during the final with, you remember, that butterfly coming from Baku in Azerbaijan and flying to uh, Malmö and taking the bridge between Copenhagen and Malmö. And um, you also have the face of uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic appearing on the building during that video and saying, welcome to Malmö, my, uh, the city where I've been born. It's very interesting to focus on that because Malmö is an underprivileged city in the south of Sweden. Uh, it is a post-industrial crisis city, a city facing a lot of uh, coexisting issues between immigrants and local Sweden. And then uh, Vladimir Ibrahimovic uh, embodies all that uh, identity of the city, being himself a migrant, coming from Serbian family, and also a Croatian family, and also Yugo former Yugoslavian <laughs> family, <laughs> and also being um, uh, coming from a poor family. So in Malmö, we have a clear case of um, uh, hosting Eurovision 
um, providing your region very good infrastructures. They were already the arena, it was a tiny arena, and there were very, very good transportation systems playing on a very transporter European um, situation between Copenhagen and Malmö. Uh, hotels were spread in Malmö and in Copenhagen. So we can say that here the whole city is benefiting to ESC and is also a very new case of showing a transformation of the city itself. It's not a national branding, it's more a city branding in that case. Then the last case and not the not the least is Tel Aviv. Uh, my dear <laughs> colleague from the Jerusalem Hebrew University uh, talked a, a lot about that, so I'm, I'm uh, you know, more in confidence to say what I'm going to say because you already said it. Uh, for me, uh, according to my point of view, here we have the three scales together and we have the two consequences together also. Um, to my point of view, regarding the controversies and all the debates, uh, in the preparation of ESC 2019, we can see that ESC and EU played a role in putting some pressure on uh, Israel government and Israel state uh, regarding uh, neutral and secular issues, but regarding also safety and security issues, uh, and that the state played some debate, as you mentioned it, saying it would be Jerusalem or no European in uh, Israel, at least. It's in Tel Aviv, so it's okay. Um, and then uh, regarding the whole city dimension, uh, I, I, there was some discussion about that, um, saying that Tel Aviv is a secular one, Jerusalem is a most religious one. And I think it's not by case that uh, um, your region is um, organized this year in Tel Aviv, the same year Jerusalem has been the fair capital of Israel for the US. And perhaps we are facing the tale of the two cities in one country, and it is making the reality of a marketing plan that we already knew in tourism, when Israel is not planning itself outside as a country, but just as a country of two cities, when you're in Paris and you know that one city is complicated towards Israel. We have no advertisement for Israel, but advertisement for Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, two, two, shunny, two shunning cities just four hours away from Paris. So we are facing that now in a political way as Jerusalem could be perceived as a political diplomatic uh, capital for some of some countries like US, not for the point of view of the European Union, but Tel Aviv could be the secular uh, capital, the place where we can go safely and where we can organize events like European Central Congress without having to be US. Perhaps if it's a path in a new direction, right? Uh, having this kind of two cities um, equilibrium, it will not be the only one country to have a situation like that. Uh, Italy, in a very uh, other way, have Milan Rome equilibrium with uh, one which is an administrative one, the other one a business and trade oriented city. Uh, and other countries are having the same kind of balance between cities with official capitals and informal capitals. Um, then for uh, ESC, then for who benefits from what? Uh, ESC is benefiting a lot from uh, Tel Aviv, uh, as Tel Aviv is providing huge public space for ESC events. We see one of the largest new village uh, organizing in the park that goes to Yafo and uh, uh, the beaches of Tel Aviv. Uh, then um, even if the arena is small, is as small as Malmö was, uh, it's still to be an already existing infrastructure, so that there were no need to build or to construct something for that. But then Tel Aviv is also uh, gaining from organizing ESC, uh, as it gains in more international recognition, uh, clearly playing on the battlefield toward Jerusalem as being perhaps uh, a more convenient city to host international events. Uh, and we will see in the forthcoming years if this momentum is um, going uh, bigger and bigger for Tel Aviv. Um, so that was very short. It was just an introduction. Just I would like to, to discuss with you or just to, um, to gain your interest about that kind of research that we could apply on various former or uh, coming uh, hosting cities because using that uh, two level of interpretation, so the, using this case, within who benefits what, could 
perhaps help us to gain a more um, consolidated vision uh, about uh, what is hosting your vision, not just from the point of view of the entertainment or of this uh, politics of state, but also from the urban scale um, perspective. Thank you very much. And I should mention that I am here, I'm a researcher in my normal life, so here is normal life, in my unnormal life, I'm quiet, which is my main pronunciation in English, written in French, so quiet, <laughs> and I am blogging for Wee Blogs, so thank you very much. So it's rare that in Eurovision we have songs that are not going up to the three minutes. <laughs> so this presentation was shorter than 15 minutes, but um, it was very interesting. Thank you very much. Our next competitor from Turkey and from the Netherlands <laughs> is uh, Mary Karpov. Big applause for her. from Netherlands and with a Russian surname. Um, so I'm going to skip the introduction bit very uh, because I need a 15 minutes. So um, this is a part of my master's thesis. Uh, uh, I'm going to present a summary. I'm going to focus on national representation. I'm a designer so I uh, did uh, research the stages of Eurovision and briefly saying for most of you uh, design is making pretty things for us it is solving problems and this is our process we get a brief uh, we make a lot of intuitive decisions there's a draft and there's a product and what is interesting is every year the brief was the same what should the Eurovision stage look like and the results were 64 very distinct stages so I was very interested in what was going on in between so what I also noticed is what we understand uh, as a viewer is different than what the designer thinks and intends so I, I will focus on intention of the designers and how much of it is actually national representation um, and for that, I read a lot of interviews, I watched documentaries, and I interviewed four Eurovision designers myself. One of them is Florian Wieder. He is like the almost all <laughs> of the last decade. He designed all, almost all of them. And uh, the first one is Irish, uh, the second one is Turkish, the third one is Finnish, and Florian Wieder worked for every country. Um, so the, what I gathered, the information I gathered is here in this very summarized table. You can see the commercial perspective is up there. There is national representation and there's some friends like futurism and globalism and there are um, other um, things that they cared a lot about. For, for instance, versatility is very important for Eurovision. Um, so, um, this is all the Eurovision stages so far, screenshots from all of them. So these are the ones that I could trace some national representation. And then I categorized them. Uh, I found some have a national discourse. Uh, they are trying to say, say something about uh, the country. And there are some more like a uh, touristic shop kind of uh, very literal uh, explanations very, very literal representations and I could categorize them too so um, there were times where I really cared about your region and every time a country couldn't couldn't host they would and every time they hosted they would have something some brand new technology on the stage and Terry Wogan would explain is it as we are the descendants of industrial revolution and we are proud to present you our newest technology. Uh, so I noticed UK was innovative back, back then. And uh, there, there is also um, these uh, Estonian and Ukrainian stages uh, where they are um, describing their revolutions as a fairy tale and an awakening and their whole stage concept is on those. And Russian stage is huge, like the 
uh, Eurovision rule is that you have six people on stage, no more, but they could have an army, a tank, and a plane, and two performers. And there would still be some room in the stage. Uh, for that reason, I think Russia is trying to make a statement by making that huge stage. Uh, these are debatable, though. Maybe you can make more of these, and maybe you can make, you can debate them. But these are pretty much out there, like um, the landscape. We see a lot of country, a lot of countries and cities inspiring from their landscape, especially the uh, Nordic countries are inspired by ice. Uh, Switzerland has a very funny representation of Matterhorn, and you can see rivers and the landscapes, like uh, Irish, but it's especially important because it actually started river dance. It came from the representation of the river, and it became river dance later. And the Serbian one is back basically a map. Um, the architecture is another point of view, uh, the point of uh, resource of inspiration uh, for these countries. Uh, what I like here is um, you can see like they are mostly based on uh, very historic um, architecture, like um, Istanbul is based on Hagia Sophia, uh, Athens one is based on ancient Greek theaters, but uh, you can see um, that Norwegian one is very contemporary. It's about it, it's based on uh, oil rigs. I, I think it's because every country was to yearn for the times they were very glamorous, but Norway is glamorous now, so they don't need to yearn for anything. I think it's about that and. For Russian one, uh, they were inspired by something that wasn't built. So maybe they're still, their glamour is still under construction, I don't know. Uh, so this one I like a lot because you can see how technology changed the interpretations. Uh, so um, Netherlands uh, in 1958 had a thousand live tulips on stage. So you can't, you can't imagine that happening next year like a thousand live tulips. And, uh, later they had uh, tulip sculptures, basically. And uh, there were three nautical uh, things, uh, one in Malmo in 1992. You can see that it was a literal Viking ship. And in Copenhagen in 2014, we have such an abstract ship that uh, most of the people think it's a diamond but it is actually a ship under construction, according to the architect. And last year, it was, again, a nautical theme uh, that was uh, d done in a very different way. And this year, uh, I, th the stage is an abstraction of Star of David, but uh, there, you have noticed there are, the screens is actually made of columns, and those columns are 12, like uh, they represent the 12 tribes of uh, Jews. So um, it has many levels of telling something about the country. Um, and okay, what I also noticed is, I think I was too quick than I expected. <laughs> uh, what I also noticed is when I put them all in a timeline, the countries are more likely to refer to their national identities when they vote born after a long time or when they born for the first time. Uh, so in Irish case, uh, they won a lot of times, but only in a few of them, they were actually very Celtic and, uh, you know, um, river, etc. Uh, or what I noticed is uh, Eastern European countries or the others that feel neglected in international media would like to use that opportunity to tell something about themselves whichever way they could. Um, so when we had the Eastern European streak uh, in 2000s, it was like, a, uh, we are going to another country, this time you're going to see amphitheater, this next time you're going to see uh, Hagia Sophia. So it was like a streak of national representation too. I mentioned the uh, second one. They, are, they mostly refer to most glorious times of the nation, whatever symbol is used. And um, 
what I also noticed talking to the designers uh, from past and now is um, it used to be more um, uh, like, uh, for instance, when RTE for uh, Ireland won, uh, they would solve the problem of hosting Eurovision internally, like they would design it internally. The project was an internal thing with like exceptional help from others, but now it is globalized, it is outsourced, so uh, wh whatever is happening is not happening within the broadcaster, it's, it's happening with uh, other designers involved from everywhere, including Russia, like uh, Florian Meter is one thing, but Russia was also built by an Irish designer uh, somewhere else, so um, that's what I also noticed, it's a sign of the globalism generally impacting the Eurovision production. I guess I'm done. So I guess I must have scared the competitors <laughs> <laughs> with the 15 minutes rule. Um, so we had a very uh, brief presentation of this very interesting uh, work that I Ah, uh, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, to read this. And I'm also looking forward to our next competitor's uh, presentation, Peter Rehberg from Berlin. Thank you so much for the invitation. Very happy to be here. I hope, I hope I'm going to make the 15 minutes. Um, let's see. All right, so um, my background is in culture theory and queer theory more specifically, and I've been working on this uh, book about Eurovision for quite some time, hopefully finishing it next year or so. And uh, really the question of queerness is at the core of it, whereas queer I understand not just in the sense of gay and lesbian, but also as a critical perspective in a larger intersectional uh, sense. Um, so um, I'm doing this old style, and I'm going to read this. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about queerness as a symbolic force to begin with. The ESC gives us one of the rare occasions where queerness paradoxically, paradox paradoxically if we think of queer theorist Lee Edelman, for example, um, occupies center stage. Even though its precise place is somewhat difficult to locate and the ways in which it is effective are not necessarily given in an intentional manner, at Eurovision queerness should be understood as a constitutive symbolic force. Every account of and report on Eurovision as an object of cultural study that overlooks its queer dimension must fail as a reading. Even the straightest commentator of the TV show has to address this, and by now Eurovision's queerness, a signifier that initially I want to embrace here for its semantic fluidity, has been widely acknowledged by a mainstream audience, albeit in contradictory ways. Queerness shaped Eurovision as a brand, a fact that continuously triggers an ambivalent, if not open, homo and transphobic hostility in the reactions to the event, both by the media and politicians, and not just in Russia. While on the other hand, it also leads to utopian ideas about a queer Europe. For its gay fans, Eurovision contains the promise of presenting an inversion of the dominant cultural order that naturalizes heteronormativity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the aesthetics of Eurovision and primarily about the question of can. One of the most visible and also most studied examples of queerness as it also abounds with Eurovision is the phenomenon of camp. Camp is generally understood as a spectacular style of performance that displays the artificiality and historicity of aesthetic forms and thus contributes to denaturalizing sexual and gender norms as for example in gay men's adoration of female Hollywood stars or pop divas. What is remarkable about Eurovision is that the phenomenon of camp familiar to us from the analysis of gay fan culture is placed here in the midst of normative social and political forces such as the representation of the nation state. Does that mean that your vision not just gives us the pleasure of queering gender norms as drag shows do at their best, but also a queering of nationality and of Europe? Let's approach this question by exploring the structural conditions of camp. One of the fundamental problems of camp theory can be expressed like that, quote, is camp an attribute of something or is it attributed to something? A wrong question, one might say, because no doubt the side of production and the side of reception both contribute in various ways 
to the construction of Eurovision as a queer camp. While Eurovision is no doubt famous for its queer heroines and heroes, such as drag queen Conchita Bulls, transgender diva Lana International, and this year's Bilal Hassani, the majority of Eurovision's acts and producers are not queer in terms of a self-identified queer personnel on the Eurovision stage. This is quite different for the side of reception. The media coverage, fan culture, and academic criticism of Eurovision have been traditionally dominated by gay men and the women whom they love. By constructing Eurovision as a camp object, queer audiences have saved Eurovision from simply being kitsch and arguably also from oblivion. Let's not forget camp is a form of work. You also have to work to make it camp. While Eurovision's gay reception can be easily documented, the question why Eurovision lends itself to be enjoyed by a gay male and queer audience is more difficult to answer. But the object that allows itself to become queerly appreciated must provide a set of criteria in order to enjoy the sort of re-evaluation and to be turned into gay-specific subcultural capital. Following Alexander Stody's uh, theorizing of popular culture, I want to suggest that we should understand the semiotic text of Eurovision itself, quote, as a distinct source of queerness. All right, so what does that mean? The critical discourse on camp names here primarily the stylistic excessiveness of the material, for instance, as in musical and visual abandons of melodrama or Broadway musical, combined with the early expiration date of mass cultural commodities that have to be continually exchanged following the imperative of newness a capitalist marketplace requires in order to flourish. Camp takes advantage of the short shelf life of pop cultural objects. This implies a certain form of temporality and historiography. Broadway musicals are from a, a quote, past geological epoch, D.A. Miller contends, and Heather Love states more generally that, quote, camp is a backward art. Camp objects are outdated leftovers discharged from mass cultural circulation. In this way, camp indicates a pop culture process of production, consumption, and recycling that we encounter in different ways in other genres of pop, for instance, in hip hop, or with the more general trend of retromania in the pop music of the 2000s, as Simon Reynolds has written about it. The lack of guaranteed value and consequently the possibility of re-evaluating camp objects from a subcultural position highly depends on the historical moment, which is why it's so difficult to come up with a valid camp canon, something that Susan Sontag wanted to establish in the 60s, for example. These structural moments of camp can certainly be found in many Eurovision performances. As a TV event, the individual acts ought to give it all within the prescribed three minutes of the song, leading to an excessive use of costumes, wind machines, and pyrotechnics on stage, as we well know. For example, and there are many, of course, uh, other examples, the German entry from 1970, and I can only give you a still here, Katja Epstein. Um, I also chose this because this was the first year that Eurovision was transmitted in color TV. And the question of technology also obviously is important here. So uh, what signs become available for different technologies that also allows us to construct um, subjects, performances, and camp differently on stage. Moreover, in distinction to other forms of commercial pop, your vision is not primarily an expression of youth culture or a product specifically aimed at teenagers or young adults as a target group. It follows the task of creating a form of consensus pop that caters, like any successful Saturday evening entertainment show, to all age groups. Offering something for everybody while offending no one, Eurovision's music often manifests itself as an eclectic archive of pop history's past trends, as it is familiar to us also from casting shows. Fashion and musical styles often only hit Eurovision after they have established or have already expired in the real pop world. Moreover, Eurovision is not necessarily the stage for A-list performers who would risk their already established fame of being susceptible to the votes of the juries and the audience, which can be difficult to predict and shape, as we know by block voting and diaspora voting. Eurovision presents either newcomers that often will be forgotten after the night of the show or only continue to be famous in the context of Eurovision. And I'm also interested in the question of what specific type of celebrity Eurovision produces here or pop stars beyond their prime, hoping for a comeback. Bonnie Tyler, you know, that one butting Patricia Kass. It brings to center stage the leftovers of a pop machinery that quickly invests in and then disposes again of its stars. The difficulty to read Eurovision's musical style as an expression of the now, arguably the strongest currency in pop music, 
posits it again in a certain proximity to musical theater and its typically overflowing and outdated styles. It is this rich visual and musical language of your vision, um, which doesn't have to prove its popularity directly on the commercial pop market that allows for a subcultural appropriation of these pop hybrids. Um, I also, of course, want to raise the question if we say this is camp, not just in a uh, descriptive way, but also raise the question whether camp can be understood as a critical strategy. Suspicion about gay camp was not only articulated from a feminist perspective that found it to be complicit in producing misogynistic images of femininity. In the context of a lesbian and gay historiography as a narrative about progress towards social and political liberation, camp is often understood as a cultural practice characteristic of the time before Stonewall. We have the 50th anniversary of Stonewall this year, of course. Or as Wayne Kerstenbaum asked, quote, after sexual liberation, who needs opera? One common charge against camp then is that with its investment in camouflaged forms of expression and transgender identifications, it is an indication of repression, a cultural format that openly gay and sexually liberated subjects would no longer have a need for. And from this perspective, it's an interesting question whether we think of Bilal Hassani actually as camp or not. Um, but camp culture persists in the present after Stonewall and after gay marriage. Quote, the drag queen does not give up his drag just because he has cracked its code, writes Wayne Kerstenbaum. So the attachment to camp is not only an anachronistic regression to pre-Stonewall culture, it demonstrates the continual existence of a queer childhood. And this is something I'm very interested in, but uh, have no time to go into here. Uh, David Halper and Matthew Sedgwick have written about this. Um, I follow a different direction here to end my talk and want to talk a little bit about the relationship between queerness and the nation. What distinguishes your vision from other examples of queer camp is um, that these moments are emerging within the context of national European representations. So how does this mission relate to the queer quality that uh, I have spelled out so far? Well, the relationship between the context, concept of a nation and cultural signs that ought to represent it is always arbitrary with your vision supposed entertainment value, a volatile category always at the risk of failing, performances eventually cannot but destabilize the seriousness of the national endeavor. Surely Eurovision entries would be far from attacking the idea of a nation openly, like say the Sex Pistols with their punk version of the British national anthem. But even without punk's aggressive macho nihilism, the shiny pop performances of Eurovision can hardly and rarely do justice to the task of representing a nation respectfully. The disproportion between the gravity of the signifier nation in relation to the light pop format, its gravity, its dependence on current, current trends, its volatility of its tastefulness cannot easily be reconciled. And this must be also um, differentiated uh, historically, of course, uh, so I do this a little bit more in general here. Um, and here is two examples from the uh, German context, Nicole and Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan performed in Jerusalem, if you remember, in 1979. Uh, four years ago, ending four, <laughs> and being a number one hit in Israel. Um, the inadequacy of pop as a format, especially the kind of pop presented at Eurovision, for the purpose of national representation seems to be a specific European problem. Whereas the association between pop musical representations and the celebration of nationality has a long history in 20th and 21st century US culture, from Marlene Dietrich appearing in front of the US troops in World War II, to Lady Gaga or Pink, performing the national anthem at the Super Bowl and thus allegorizing the nation through a sexualized female body or a powerful female voice, the relationship between popular music and the nation proves to be much more precarious in the European and German context. So I'm going to skip this a little bit to uh, end on time. And I just want to say, of course, you know, in the German context, um, the case has been made that this is a question that goes back to fascism and the instrumental use of pop culture uh, by the Nazis. Um, and this being a specific German problem. However, um, culture theorist Andreas Hüssen also makes the case that this goes actually back further in Western history to a certain discourse by the end of the 19th century where mass culture has been connotated as feminine. Uh, so I would make the case and say here that one of the interesting things about your vision is that the specific uh, mass cultural pop format uh, presented here uh, at your vision, and we know that other genres like rock Etc. Um, 
hit uh, the contest relatively late, that this has everything to do with the problems involved in national representation. Perhaps we can come back to this in our discussion. So I will come to my conclusion. Uh, the necessary defeat of Eurovision entries in terms of aesthetic standards, popularity, and in fulfilling the mission of national representation in a meaningful way is, of course, precisely what enables Eurovision's clear potential. Queerness at Eurovision then does not just rely on the specific material conditions of the entries, such as semiotic excessive, excessiveness and quick disposability that we know from other genres and cultural contexts, but beyond their short shelf life, the plethora of pop signs and their debatable value are linked to the categories of the national and the European. Representing a nation at Eurovision remains a risky business. It is no surprise then that this aesthetic and discursive regime of Eurovision is in fact a recipe for disaster, that is to say, a queer triumph. The question that remains to be asked for our present is, how powerful is this force of queer desire, uh, how powerful it proves to be when faced with the political and economic forces of neoliberalism that no longer repress the desiring subject in a one-dimensional form through discipline, but produce complicity with hegemonic forms of power and control through enjoyment. Thank you. So these were the three contributors, the three compet uh, competitors in our science slam. And for every good competition, we need a recap. And this recap, we will do it together here in front. So I ask the three competitors to come here. And I will check in the meantime also if you have sent questions to the competitors on the internet because you can take part in the discussion as well as all the people here in the room. So, Madam Peter Etienne, please, please come. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but you need to come closer to the microphone because otherwise people will not be able to understand your answers. So, um, let's start in the running order. You have five minutes for the questions and answers. So, please ask your questions now. Everybody's taking pictures, like in Eurovision. <laughs> so, this is the photo moment. Uh, yeah, please. like that, it will be a bit 
more local, more ethnic. Uh, I heard at least Turkey to have some uh, criteria for uh, the singers. But when it was about the stage, they had no instructions. The, the, the designers came up with these concepts. The designer was trying to use Yes. Yeah, I, I didn't ask specifically for this, but probably because because uh, the last time Israel hosted, they also tried to make it more national, national, uh, using uh, um, Israeli artists as the designer, but it didn't work out, and they had a pretty generous stage. So I don't think it's their main goal here. I think the designer, and I think me sending my pieces to him actually inspired him a little bit too, but I don't want to debate that right now. I find it a computer, I think the most fascinating, most for me, and the biggest example is the example of geography, but presenting the nation, that's pretty into the soft stuff and weird gap with geography, and I wonder if you can speak more about what this means to the crisis yeah, I mean, you know, like, this is very complicated in a certain way because one has to really think about this historically. I think there was a time in Eurovision studies when talking about camp in itself was already a gesture of criticism, right? And um, where it was all about, you know, the point has been made that Eurovision really had, had its coming out with Dana's victory 20 years ago. That's when, uh, you know, the rest of the world couldn't ignore anymore that this is in so many ways a queer event on so many different levels. Um, however, a lot has happened since then, you know, so we also have things like commodity camp, like camp that is produced because people know this is a queer contest. So there's a lot of recycling going on. So we, I, I guess what I want to say is uh, we cannot take um, the concept of camp uh, for granted as a critical tool anymore. So uh, the tension, coming to your question, the tension that I think I originally uh, posited between the serious business um, of the na uh, representing the nation state and the, the silly fun of camp, that tension is, I think, uh, somehow evaporating. And perhaps um, Netta is an example for that. Yeah? Because in a way you would say Netta is coming from a camp t tradition. Uh, she is, you know, there's the uh, there, there is the, she's a queer diva, there is the fat empowerment movement, there's the Me Too, Me Too movement, obviously. There's a lot of social discourses that come together in the persona of Netta, and she celebrates diversity. So this would be a, a, a very typical camp moment of Eurovision. However, this was not a reason for Netanyahu to not use her as an instrument uh, the day after, right? So that's a really interesting case to me, how this is, what's going on here, right? So is Netta queering Netanyahu, or is Netanyahu using Netta as an instrument and he queering Netta, or what's going on? Or is, you know, that, that raises the question whether queer or camp are still potent critical terms in the context of Eurovision. So, any other questions? Yes. So, well, the implication of Designer thing is a very recent thing. Uh, most of the time, it was uh, them uh, working, like the local designers making it, and it was an effort of a group together. Uh, for instance, the, in the Finnish case, they even uh, made a contest about how to reflect uh, something national best. Uh, so um, it depends on every um, every year. It depends on how they approach it. Um. <laughs> yeah, sorry, because my question is 
the final decision is uh, you asked about final decision the it, it is a, a group effort most of the time and the final decision is probably an approval or disapproval from the uh, hosting TV station and I think that's all like uh, it's also is about the budget sometimes when they have to want to do more technical things but with the concept uh, I think the designers are mostly responsible we're mostly responsible any other questions Etienne, uh, why did you pick exactly these three cities? Because they are so different in, in terms of the way they use Eurovision, or? Yeah, they are very contrasting. So they are very different. Yeah. Um, they are No question. Okay, it's a quarter to one, so if we want to have a result, then I will ask all the participants to... Uh, first, thank you very much for your presentations. Big applause for the contestants. 
And so I will ask all the participants here in the conference and all people um, online to cast their votes. So you have, uh, of course, you can vote for all the three candidates. So you can, you should not just say one name, but to make it fair, you have three, two, and one vote. So three votes for the candidate you liked most, two votes for the candidate you liked second most, and one vote for the candidate you liked third most. So, Tel Aviv, start voting now. <laughs> Do we have to stand here? No, you, you, you can vote, but don't vote to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that, that's real, true Eurovision. <laughs> I'm Eastern European, I do block water. <laughs> so, please come to the camera so that people can see you. Hello? I'll be collecting the votes <laughs> in the room. <laughs> so you see, this is all, um, all, all is going fair. So there's a notary somewhere. Well, trust us. <laughs> Sophia will then count the votes. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure what to do at the end of a lack, but... Okay, Genghis Khan. Sie ritten durch die... Wie geht das denn los? Jens, Sie ritten durch die Wüste mit dem Steppenwind? Ah, Sie ritten durch die Wüste mit dem Steppenwind, tausend Mann. Ha! Hu! Ha! Noch einer ritt voran dem Volk in alle den Schickes Ha! Hu! Ha! Die Hufe ihrer Pferde, die peitschen in Sand, die trugen Angst und Schrecken in jedes Land und weder Blitz noch Donner hielt sie auf. Hu! Ha! Ching! Ching! Ching ist Khan! Hey Leute, ho oh Leute, hey Reiter, immer weiter! Ching! Ching! Ching is Khan, auf Brüder, auf Brüder, auf Brüder, immer wieder, lass doch Wodka holen, ho, 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 denn wir sind Mongolen, ha, 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 und der Teufel kriegt uns früh genug. <lacht> ching, ching, ching is Khan, hey Leute, ho, Leute, hey Leute, immer weiter, ching, ching, ching is Khan, äh, <lacht> er tanzt wenn er so immer und man hört ihn lachen, hohohoho, immer lauter lachen, ahahaha. Und, äh, und ach, ja genau, und der nimmt den Krug in einem Zug. Okay. <lacht> And it was a big discussion in Germany that Germany would be present with Israel with such a such a warfare song. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
So we have a result. So where's where's the exciting music? So like make some. <laughs> they said the public has to do something. Yeah. So at least make some rumor. <laughs> so it's a very very close run. So we have uh, on number three with seven votes. Etienne, Ooh. applause. <laughs> so France in the top three, we haven't seen this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, and second and first position are very close. So on second place, we have second place with 14 votes and first place with 16 votes. Ooh. <laughs> and the first place is going to a country. I said the first place, I said the second place, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so the first place is going to a country that is uh, that used to be very successful in Eurovision, but is not taking part anymore. Oh. So, bravo for me, Karpov. Please. I'm happy that I represented Turkey in one way, and showed them that we can still win, so we should be participating. And I'm proud to present you the prize, which is actually perfect for you because you're a designer. This is a new designer. Uh, there's a famous Israeli typographical designer. He designed a, like a new collection for the Eurovision. This is like a pillow cover with his special design. You see it uh, now in our boots with the name Diva, which is uh, really appropriate Viva to Mary. Yeah. Yeah. So our <laughs> Diva of uh, Eurovision research, Mary. Congratulations. Bravo. Any last words you want to say to your fans? Uh, it's amazing to share something that I worked so hard on to, with people who actually are interested in it. And I will never forget this experience. Thank you for your words, words too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone taking part in the Science Slam. Thank you to all on, online who followed this interesting presentation. and. Carla's coming and wrapping up the first day of our Eurovision conference. Thank you, Irving. So it's my mission to close today's session. I'm really happy to be here. I was at the first session in Lisbon um, as a participant, um, like many of you today. And so I hope that we are contributing to the development and further establishment of Eurovision studies. So for me, it was a great pleasure to be with all of you here today, um, you know, to hear um, Galia talk about um, how the ESC is, in this edition, legitimizing, delegitimizing uh, Israel, depending on who we're looking at, the host country, the international um, activists, uh, the international community, and how, you know, these forces are playing out currently, and obviously we still have a few days, so a lot more um, can be happening and we'll be keeping our eye on what is going to happen uh, in the next few days in terms of these um, discussions. Then we had our science slam uh, with um, Etienne from France is developing the idea for his PhD project um, on the impact of the Eurovision on urban space and urban development. I think it's going to be a really interesting area to you know, keep an eye out and more and more how cities and government and city diplomacy is really an area that is upcoming. So I think the ESC as another mega event is, is going to be quite important for many cities. So we'll see who's going to host next. I don't have a favorite, so it's okay. <laughs> um, then we had the pleasure to hear from uh, Merv, our winner of the Science Slam. Um, that presented her MA work 
and so it's interesting to see the traces of national representation on stage um, you know and we will see then everyone will see um, in the next few days how that um, is happening in t uh, the current edition and then we had um, Peter presenting the work he's developing for his forthcoming book so I'm very curious to read about it and I know that everyone online in here will also um, be looking forward to um, that publication on queerness in the Eurovision and specifically the phenomenon of camp and really how the queerness and nation are playing out. So that's been our session for today. And tomorrow we have more. Um, so we start again at 10 o'clock. Uh, Naftali building in room two, 201. So on the other side of the corridor. Um, and we will be having two round tables um, with stakeholders, the first one and the second one more with academics, but two designed to be very interactive with the audience, um, continuing debating and bringing more voices into the debate of the Eurovision. So once again, thank you very much to the University of Tel Aviv for hosting us. Thank you to all that agreed to participate Thank you to all that came um, to see and to participate in the debates. I hope to see you again tomorrow. So thank you and bye everyone. Thank you.